Welcome to the Awakened Goddess Show, your source for inspiration, wisdom, and personal discovery. The place to learn from a diverse mix of mentors, metaphysical experts, spiritual leaders, and best-selling authors from around the world. I'm Angela Wilkinson, mindset mentor and founder of the Awakened Goddess Academy. Join me as I explore the minds of my masterful guests while they share powerful insights and easy-to-use tools you can start using right away. Now, let's tap into the energy of the Awakened Goddess and be enlightened by today's guest. Hey, I'm your host, Angela Wilkinson, and welcome to this episode of the Awakened Goddess Show. Diane Bischoff-James is a best-selling author, speaker, and life reboot coach who educates clients in the latest techniques for manifesting and transforming their hearts, minds, and bodies for optimal, authentic living. Having found herself completely off track, she lost 60 pounds, left a highly successful but exhausting executive corporate career, rid herself of depression, conquered debilitating health problems, pursued her passion as an actress, navigated a healthy divorce, and survived the perils of an addictive relationship and co-created a new one, vital and real, all after 40. Today, Diane and I talk about her wake-up call that catalyzed her to completely change her life, the warning signs she missed along the way, and how she pursued her dreams. But before I talk with Diane, are you ready to ditch dating drama? Say goodbye to Mr. Right now to meet your real Mr. Right? Join me for the Love Spark program, where you'll learn how to master love from the inside out with the powerful five-step formula that'll help you meet the one and have your happily ever after. For more information about the program, go to theawakengoddess.com forward slash love hyphen spark, and you can sign up there. Now let's talk to Diane. Well, welcome Diane to the Awakened Goddess show. I am thrilled to have you joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I have been so excited about this. I'm very happy to be here. Yes. Well, you know, when we first met, it was like there was something about your energy, at least for, from my end, um, very familiar. I think we've had like a past life or something together. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree with you more. I felt like we were best friends in the first maybe about 30 seconds. I was about to tell you my entire life story. We're going to go sit down and grab a cup of coffee and do girlfriend talk. I know. I love that. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I... Uh, I have to tell you, you gave me your book, and let me just say, it was like definitely a page turner. You, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> the way you wrote your book, I mean, you're completely authentic, very vulnerable. You show your your good sides, your dark sides, your everything in between, and um, just your your colorful writing. You just, I felt like I was right there with you. So, well, I'm so thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate that. I, I consider myself to be living proof <laughs> that you can go through all these changes, all these trials, some tribulations, some highs, some lows, and come out on the other side, crafting your life the way you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And so I figure I'm every man's story in a way, all the tough stuff that we have to go through kind of swimming through the mud yeah. <laughs> to get out on the other side to the beautiful lake and to look, look up in the sky and say, Oh, this is so much nicer. I like this yeah. better. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, and because so many, like I'll just call them self-help books out there are very polished and it's like, you don't really get to see behind the scenes. So I really did appreciate that about your book. And so I'm really excited for you that you um, actually received an award for your book, which uh, I should say the name. It's the Real Brass Ring. Um, and then what's the tagline? Change your life course now. Yeah. Yeah. So how exciting to get awards for your book. Um, so wh what were the awards and, and uh, how did that come about? Well, I was, I was really thrilled. Within the first couple of months of having the book published and out, I received uh, a couple of awards. One was a Bella Online Award. It was an international award for, um, for uh, being authentic and real and creating self-help type books. And then I uh, received an award from Aspire Magazine. Last year is one of the top 10 inspirational books for 2015. 
So I was, you know, beyond thrilled and honored because uh, it's it's one thing to put your uh, dirty laundry out there. <laughs> <laughs> And there was the other piece of it, which is I had a lot of fear tied to writing it and putting it out. And so I didn't know, I had no idea how it would be received. And uh, I came from a family where it was about never exposing your secrets. Mm. It was about keeping up that perfect persona. And we do everything right and never let them see you sweat. So when I put the book out there that was all the dirty laundry, uh, I was kind of terrified. Mm-hmm. So when I, when I did get that award, it was that one time I got to take a deep breath and kind of relax and I felt like, okay, this is all right. It was all right to put the story out there because people can relate because it's all of us. We're all going through change. We're all going through lessons. And so I felt like it was that little pit, that little bit of a, a validation from the universe that said, no, it's okay. Thumbs up. Uh, people, people will be able to get some help from this and they will be able to also see that their stories matter. Mm-hmm everybody's story matters because it's all about the learning experience. And so I, I felt very honored and very, very, very grateful that I got that. Yeah. Well, and it, it uh, truly speaks to, um, you know, what you shared in the book and how impactful it is for so many people. Yeah. So, okay, let's talk about this fear because um, as a business owner, um, you know, the, the work that I put out there is around love and relationships. And let's talk about how you um, moved through that fear to share those really vulnerable pieces about yourself and your life um, to help transform people. Because I know a lot of business people, they want to not talk about that stuff. They want to, you know, talk about the, the pretty happily ever after, but not the process. So how'd you get through that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, part of it is, uh, you know, I always like to say, may your life be half as good as it appears on Facebook (laughs) 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 because it's, it's another way for us to put up what we want people to see, which may or may not be what's really going on. Uh, So I, I was, um, I actually had a calling to write the book since I was very, very young and I put it off forever it was not something I was very comfortable doing. I wanted to write, uh, well, actually, the whole thing started when I met with um, Sonia Choquette. Mm-hmm. This goes back uh, several years now, almost 13 years. And I was doing the whole American Dream story, trying to get the big house and the cute shoes and the nice car and make sure everybody thought that I had all the materialistic stuff because that's what I was trained in, especially growing up more, you know, in the um, being the tail end of baby boomers. That's what we were taught by Lots of stuff, look great all the time, and again, have this perfect persona. And so I was doing all that, got the big degree. I had my own business, talking about business owners. And then I realized that after I got the mini mansion across from the lake, and I had the Prada bag, and I had a really cute red convertible, <laughs> that, and then three kids, and then had to be there at lunch duty, and also running around, making sure I'm a helicopter parent, making sure everybody has, it's all covered. In everything, everybody's life was covered, not mine so much, but everybody else's life was covered. Some strange synchronistic things happened. I had in one week, two people tell me, you have to go see this woman. Mm. And I'm like, okay, fine. You know, what's her name? And her name was Sonia Choquette. And at the time she was not quite as well known as she is right now. Mm-hmm. She had a couple books out, but she had, people saw her in her home and she was a reader. She was a psychic. And I thought, okay, that's kind of weird. I got these messages. Okay, I'll just do it. So I gave myself this as a birthday present to go sit in front of her. And I thought she'd tell me, keep it up, girl. You know, you're rocking on. (laughs) You know, do more business, get more clients, be a better marketeer, which is my business uh, at the time was a marketing consultant. And um, instead, I sat in her office in her house in downtown Chicago for an hour and she literally undressed me. I mean, seriously, she took every layer of cover up, every bit of makeup, every, (laughs) everything I had on me and took it off. And she said that I was completely off track. My life was going on, you know, I climbed a ladder, but it was the wrong ladder that I was supposed to be an actor, an author, a teacher, a healer. And that if I didn't hurry up and grab at the real brass ring, it was going to be too late for me. Mm. And Quite frankly, I didn't even know what she was talking about. I just, all I knew is you work till you drop, you make as much money as you can, and you just keep everybody moving. And so um, I I just basically sat there, took it all in, went into post-traumatic shock in a way. I mean, how could I be almost 40 and do everything wrong? 
Right. And it wasn't a little bit wrong. I wasn't doing anything in the creative arts. I wasn't, I hadn't written anything. I was just doing what they told me to do. I was this soldier marching down the role of, you know, getting as many acquisitions as possible. And so I had a huge wake up call and she was really polite though at the time um, when I met with her, she said, you know, wrong guy <laughs> Talk about relationships. Yeah. It's like you have this fraternal relationship. It's not a heartfelt relationship. She's like, you're really on the wrong complete path. She said, on your overarching path, your job is to find your heart. And you're so off track, you don't even have one anymore. Mm. So that was kind of a smack upside the head. (laughs) Great. I have no heart. I'm in the wrong job uh, that I was not helping others. My my life was to contribute to others by sharing my stories, which was really funny because I hadn't shared anybody, any stories or anything with anyone. And so... She went on and on. It just kind of beat me up. And then she was too kind to talk about this part, but I was also 190 pounds at the time. So I was grossly overweight. And then she said, I'm going to tell you something nobody else is going to call you out on. She said, you are chronically and clinically depressed. Mm. But I hadn't told anybody. I was sucking down Prozac like there was no tomorrow. I was just taking those little white pills because it was the only thing that kind of made me get up and get going throughout the day. So once I had my um, hit rock bottom, which is how I felt after I was about to leave her office. Yeah. Happy uh, birthday to you. (laughs) Yeah. Happy birthday in tears. (laughs) I literally went to my car. It was, it was just about, you know, February, Chicago. We're freezing to death. It's like five degrees outside. I sat in my car, in my frozen car and cried for about 20 minutes because I didn't know what to do. I did. I had no idea how to start and fix everything. So um, I left, drove off and thought, you know what, I got to go to a business meeting. I have to look like I haven't been sobbing. And so I just kind of pulled myself together and carried and and just let it all sink in and gel. And I had to move forward from there. And so it involved fixing body, fixing relationships, fixing business, fixing creative path, fixing kind of life purpose path, and then taking a look at how I was going to also now recreate a healthy, happy home for my kids because I, I still had kids. Mm-hmm. And that's why it always makes it always makes me laugh when people are like, oh, I love Eat, Pray, Love. I, I love that book too, but there was no trip <laughs> halfway around the world to <laughs> India where I got to take all my money and just sit in an ashram and, you know, have a few flings. I mean, I have I had a real life here with real people who needed me. And I think it's about rebooting while you have all the stuff going on, right. not that you get to escape your old life. There's no escape. I mean, we have bills to pay. We have mm-hmm. dentist appointments to go to. You know, <laughs> we have snow to shovel. And, you know, my bumper almost came off or the bottom of my car came off in the giant last <laughs> ice storm we had. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I had to drive into the shop and say, what's that noise? He's like, the bottom of your car is falling off. I'm like, Fantastic! Bring it on. So, uh, so that's the kind of stuff I like. I like to. I like to feel like maybe um, the story is about helping people to evolve and grow and change and learn those really, really critical lessons that most of us are working on similar lessons, but we're all working on different facets of them. And to how to do that and maintain your life and make sure your family's okay and make sure you're okay and make sure that your relationship gets stronger. Mm-hmm. So it was a little bit of a hodgepodge in, in how it happened, but. Um, but that's how the whole thing started. So, yeah. so getting back to your question, the relationship part um, was one of the many pieces, one of the many pieces that had to be um, evaluated. Mm-hmm. And that was tough because yeah. it wasn't as if anyone did anything wrong. So I like to dispel the myth that, you know, we have these evil partners that are robbing us or having affairs or doing terrible things. That's most of the time not the case. I think um, I just didn't have a heart connection with my husband at the time. And 16 years later, we still didn't have a great heart connection. Mm -hmm. So I think that the great challenge in some of these relationships is how to do a really uh, appropriate evaluation and say, is it something where we really had a great connection? We just need to revitalize it. Is it where I'm just looking for someone who resonates really positively with me and maybe this isn't the right person? Or is it that we just grew and the path went in completely different directions? And... Maybe that's a beautiful thing instead of something to be critiqued. So when it comes to relationships, I have a really unique philosophy in that nothing goes in two straight lines parallel straight up next to each other. Nothing. Trees don't grow like that. 
Grass doesn't grow like that. Nothing, nothing goes in two straight lines from A to B. So as we meet and then grow together, sometimes they, they separate. Sometimes they can come back. Sometimes they cross over. And so how to look at where you are in that relationship and to make changes. And mine was clearly we went off in different paths. There was no way for me to rekindle something that didn't exist. It wasn't the right partner for me. So I had to um, very honestly and very openly say this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then try to keep everybody else safe and well in the process, which is messy, difficult, ugly, scary, all the, all the dark. Divorce is never fun. There's right. nothing. There's never anyone who has a great divorce, but I just say at least we had a healthy divorce. Mm -hmm. Not happy, but healthy. When I, I think that's a really great point you bring up that the things don't grow just in these nice, clean, parallel lines. We don't just grow at the same pace in the same direction with our partner. And I think that if you look at how we kind of do relationships in society, it's like you just hold on for dear life because you never know. Like if you divorce your partner, what's on the other side? Oh my God, am I going to be alone for the rest of my life? No, it's just kind of like this really um, lack, like that needy, lacky um, idea. <laughs> but I love what you just brought up. I love that because now that I do coaching, reboot coaching with um, different clients and they're all over the country – the one core issue that almost everybody is terrified of is that we're going to end up alone, mm -hmm. which is that fear. And the, the, the strange part about it is that, of course, we're born alone. We end up passing alone. And this whole life, we hold on, like you said, as if everything's going to end. And they, they equate, actually, it, which is so interesting, they equate Ending a relationship, whether you're in a, whether it's just even a boyfriend or you've had a long-term relationship, they equate it to body death. Yeah. As humans, it's as if somebody died. Wow. And that's why it takes people a long time. And it should take a while. You should really think about this. But, but that's why sometimes when it's super unhealthy, and I've been so, you know, I've had the chance to travel all over the country, went to Portland to meet you, and, and I have people come into my booth and sit down and talk to me, and they share their stories. And I would have to say it, probably 90% of them are talking about the fact that the relationship has, ha, needs, needs an upgrade, mm -hmm. needs changes. In some cases, it's so grossly unhealthy that it's clear to me and maybe others that maybe that's not the right relationship for this person, but they're not going to leave. Well, that's okay too. Maybe they, maybe they create their own, they grow as an individual within the relationship, mm -hmm. but they allow their partner to sit in front of the TV and, and oftentimes I hear, you know, the person consumes way too much alcohol or that they don't, they don't do anything to help. They don't contribute, but this person does not want to make a change. You know, that's okay. That's part of your growth path. Everybody has their own path. Everybody has their own timing. Um, but when they're ready, maybe they want to explore something new for themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's more about like, how do you become fully yourself first and then decide how you want to have either a partner that's fully contributing or in some cases, you're with a partner. I've heard so many people tell me stories about they're with a partner who cannot, will not, and has never really contributed to the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're just, but they're and, not going to leave either. Yeah, so it's you know, it's it's our. I think I think it all goes back to the fear of being alone. When it, it, you, those um, those blinders of the bliss, the the honeymoon period, kind of finally go away, and then you start seeing maybe where patterns are showing up or um, you're, you're putting more into the relationship than your partner or all these things that we don't want to look at. But I believe that we attract people, partners into our life to help us along our journey. And it's a matter of, I think, always going back to ourselves and, and taking care of ourselves first and looking at, you know, who am I in this relationship and is this serving me? Absolutely. Absolutely. And every relationship is sacred, mm -hmm. which is a really nice way to look at it because it's there as your, as your number one mirror. It's kind of like the mirror, mirror on the wall kind of thing. That person is reflecting back how you allow yourself to be treated. They're reflecting back. Some of your needs are being met. Maybe others aren't. But if I could just share with you, one of my huge bugaboos is that, 
I think the one thing we get no education on, and this is really sad in many ways, and I wish we could fix this part. I think partners do not get education on how to communicate what needs are not being met. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in your counseling business, and most of us, because my background is in psychology and I've, um, you know, I, I'm, I do a lot of counseling in, in coaching. There's usually basic needs that if they were met would improve the relationship so dramatically. If we could learn how to say it so other per- the other person can hear it, you have someone who's willing to work with you and someone who's willing to make slight adjustments so that these needs can be exposed and then they can meet them. I mean, it, it, it's really... It's really interesting how I'm sure you, I'm sure you've had the same thing where you have a relationship and you finally speak your truth and you say, if you would just be nice to me <laughs> <laughs> when you come home and come to me and say hi and how is your day and give me the hug instead of just storming in and talking about the fact that, you know, the house is messy, you know, we could really start this evening out on a nice foot. I mean, sometimes the needs are very, are very basic. You know, it's about care and consideration or, or that one book that says, how would you, how would you act? How would you act like if you did love me? (laughs) You know, (laughs) (laughs) I'm a person you're supposed to love. How would you act? Let's pretend, let's pretend you do there for a minute. Um, And I think we do, we get, we get in our, we get in our little ruts and, um, and, and that's the part where I think it's a lot of it's education. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of it is just um, willingness, willingness to, um, they're calling it now the gray divorce. I don't know if you heard about that. No. Yeah, I guess that um, I couldn't help but I was watching like Judge Judy or something and they were talking about, um, it just happened to be on TV and I thought, what an interesting term. I guess that it's a new phenomenon where there's a lot of women who are in uh, their 40s and, and 50s and even 60s who uh, want to feel whole and complete. They want to feel better about their lives and they're having kind of sneak divorces where they just say, I don't want to do this anymore. I I would rather be in my fullness, feeling really happy with myself. And so I guess they're, they're calling them great divorces where um, the men are surprised and the women say, I want to break free. So it's just a really interesting time. I go back to a lot of like, I wish we had more education. I wish we could do more to offer people. I wish that, and I'm, one of the things I'd like to do in the future, I have another book coming, is to even have a whole course, a simple communication course. Um, I've been able to share a lot with the clients about the simple act of how to say it so my needs are, you know, what need isn't being met, what the person can do, what agreements you have so that both of you can meet each other's needs, and then you actually have consequences when it doesn't happen. <laughs> right. Which always goes back to, you still didn't take out the garbage. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's it's, it is very tricky to communicate your needs where you're honoring yourself and you're honoring the other person. That takes a lot of courage, a lot, it takes a lot of um, knowing who you are and really um, being uh, proactive versus waiting until things become, they're like festering. And then, you know, it's just like you become naggy and. Oh, it's micro true thing. It's micro true thing. And I even going back to the garbage. Uh, my 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 poor fiance. We we we've been engaged for a long time just because it's a perfect condition for us is to be. I call it forever engaged. And so uh, we've been engaged for a long time. And I'll say, okay, your job is the garbage. So when the garbage starts to smell, our agreement is. I said I'm going to put it in your room. I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to put it in the room where you know you like to hang out. And when you're ready, because it will no longer bother me, please take it outside. I said, you are in charge of the garbage. And so we've had this agreement and I have to do it sometimes because I I think they're, you know, it's, I don't have to get mad. I I used to get mad. I used to get upset. And so now I don't. Now I'm like, we have a consequence. You know what it is. (laughs) (laughs) Accept your consequence. And so it it really has helped. It helped quite a bit. So we try to make light of it. We try to make it fun and not, not take um, all of the, the day to day grind too seriously. Because I I think we're all after a while, as you said, it, it gets stale and sometimes the truth is, I think we all get annoying. <laughs> we're all yeah. annoying to each other, you know, so we're just people. We're just people trying to grow and learn. And so, so we try to keep it light and fun. And the most important thing, I think, is people lose play time. There's, um, I wish that there was more dedicated time to going out laughing. Mm-hmm. Notice how you used to smile together, used to laugh, used to do really fun things. So uh, we, we make sure we get dedicated play time every single week. And the weekends we don't or we skip it, I feel so different. I feel cheated in a way like I didn't get to have be my fun self and 
and experience my fun self with my fiance's fun self. And so I've really noticed that there's formulas that work and there's formulas that don't work. And as long as we stick with the really healthy ones, things go a lot better. And we micro truth in the moment. The poor guy has heard more stuff out of my mouth than I, I wish he probably wishes he never heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, explain what micro truthing is. Micro truthing means to express yourself in a clear, healthy way in the moment, in the moment, as close to the moment as you can. So sometimes, you know, you get that little zinger, like mm -hmm. a, like it feels like someone kind of like said something and it really irked you or, or kind of set you off. Um, I really work hard at expressing myself in the moment and say, when you said that, I felt hurt, I felt upset, I felt um, slightly dissed, I, I'm not quite sure where you're coming from, but can we talk about it now so I can understand what you intended to mean instead of me taking it as a, as a something that's going to hurt me. And you, we can almost always clear it up within a minute mm -hmm. because most of the time we're assuming other people are thinking something and they're not. Right. And so, so it allows you to be really clean. And, and I'll just give you an example that one time we were just in a rough, a rough patch, a really rough patch. And I said, I'm just going to come clean with you. I said, I don't know if we're going to make it. And he stops and he looks at me and I go, really, I don't know if we're going to make it. And that scares me to death. Hmm. And he's like, I don't know if we are either. And we talked about it. We sat down. We stopped what we were doing. We said, you know, all we can do is take it a moment at a time and say, this is kind of a, you were just having a lot of fights, but I want to make it, but I, I'm terrified we're not going to. And, and it, the weird thing is five minutes later, we have this, we start, I start crying. We have this whole conversation. And he was like, maybe we should go out to dinner. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Yeah. We went out to dinner and we had fun because I expressed the fear. The yeah. fear is we're not going to stay together. Well, and in that moment, you had a deeper um, level of connection and intimacy, which it's like, yeah, I mean, that's what I think we lose in relationships a lot of times because we um, guard ourselves from saying the wrong thing or protecting ourselves or the other person. And then we kind of um, take away, we sanitize the relationship. Exactly. But what if you spoke that inner fear? Because mm -hmm. usually they're the same fears. You know, someone's going to, you're going to hurt, you're going to hurt me, you're going to leave me, you don't care about me. You know, it's some of the basic, the very, very basic stuff about connection, about being important, about being a, a, a someone who is on your radar screen, someone you care about. And those simple, those very simple key points, when those are hit and the person mm -hmm. It just resonates so much higher in the relationship that the relationship moves to a new level the minute I actually I actually make it a point when I feel like I've been a little brusque. <laughs> <laughs> Can't happen. And uh, because I am so clear, I am so honest all the time, sometimes I think maybe it comes across a little too harsh in the way I've said things. So I'll make it a point the next day to call and say, you know, I just want to know, I really appreciate the fact that you're doing all these things for me. He helps me a lot with um touring. He helps me coming across the country. He's helped me with my website. And I said, I want to let you know, I really appreciate that you're doing all these things. I know you're doing this above and beyond your work and it's important. And, and I, I want to thank you for that. And it it's changes everything because I took that one little moment to say, you're important to me and I appreciate you. I appreciate you. And I see what you're doing because a lot of times, what if somebody said, thanks mom <laughs> or <laughs> that 8 million times you've run my lunch over to school. I mean, it's really funny. It's more like they grab the lunch and they're like, oh, and they take off. And so it's just the, could, could you say thanks? That would, little, <laughs> funny, those little, those little nuggets mean so much. But of course, you know, they're children too, and children are even less, less aware. Yes. <laughs> they're more egocentric. Everything, the world revolves around them. <laughs> that and many other things. Yes. Yes. They're all good kids, but the, I think the, you know, we look forward to that one day when they come back and they'll say, Wow, you're you did a lot for me, and, and you're a great mom. And we of course will melt to the ground. We'll say, <laughs> I waited thirty years. Thank you, thank you for saying that. So yeah. it's really funny. It doesn't take much. It really doesn't take much to to uh, to take that resonant value that we all have and to boost it up a tiny bit and to use these relationships and make each other feel better during the day instead of kind of using each other for punching bags, which I think can unfortunately it can kind of be the. Uh, the path, I get all emotional when I would talk about this, uh, yeah. but it's kind of the path went that, that, that we can go down. And that's part of that growth that we we're talking about. Um, that's why I always find the convention of marriage to be, it, it, I don't know even know if it, I'm, 
I'm not against it. I'm not for it. It's just, it just, I don't know if it makes sense to say that you start from A and you go to Z and nothing changes in between A and Z. There's so many opportunities for growth and change, personal growth, Mm -hmm. to find yourself, to find what you love to do, maybe to find your passion. Maybe it's to move. Yeah. I mean, we, we both love the East and, you know, maybe, maybe it's to express the fact that you'd either like to, um, possibly change where you live and to find a partner where you could have that conversation and say, can we at least talk about, could we go together? Mm-hmm. Would it, I, I was just having a, a client, uh, a client session where, um, she has a, 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 an older husband and he's in his late seventies and she's, she's a lot younger. She's a business professional, but they have this beautiful relationship. And she said, I'd like to move. I want to pick up and move. And, um, he said, let's go. Because I, I don't have any reason to stay here. And so it just get, added a whole new level of excitement to the relationship. Mm-hmm. And they already have a really beautiful connection. But it was she was terrified to say because she's like, I don't think somebody who's more set in their ways is going to want to make changes. Like, you don't know until you ask. And maybe you could work it out so that it could be really refreshing for both of you. Imagine exploring a whole new part of the country. Mm-hmm. And so those are the things where I think people get very stuck and very staid instead of trying to make it always fresh and new. Yeah. I think yeah, you you bring up that that um, that we have this fear to ask questions yes. of ourselves and our partner, and um, so I want to go back to kind of looking back at when you met with Sonia, and you were kind of unaware that your life was on not on track. Right. So looking back, I'm wondering if there were um, like warning signs that you weren't picking up on that you could kind of think back now and be like, oh, wow, that was a huge sign. I just did not get it. Absolutely. And it's thank you so much. That's a great question. Uh, Well, first of all, being grossly overweight was a huge telltale sign. I was um, for me, food was love. Mm -hmm. And that's that was the only source of love. I was the, um, I was serving others all the time doing this role that I thought I was supposed to do. And I was so unhappy and so miserable on the inside that I would use any kind of treat, any kind of baked goods, anything I could find that had sugar or caffeine just to keep going. And I was so heavy, um, that it also was breaking my body down. So I hurt everywhere. I mean, every single joint. And so I was like, I was like head, shoulders, knees and toes, <laughs> just like everything. Plantar fasciitis and my knees were breaking down. I had sciatica. I had lower back pain. I had shoulders and neck. And um, it got, it was so bad, actually. I didn't tell Sonia all about the body issues. Uh, and she, she brought it up a little bit. She goes, you really need to get massages and look, look after your body. But at the, at the point, I mean, my shoulder was probably so bad that if I hadn't, taken, if I really hadn't taken a look at it, I might've had full shoulder replacement surgery by the time I was, you know, going to be 50. I mean, I had so many things breaking down. So the body is always talking to you. In fact, they say the one thing that never lies is your body. Well, isn't, isn't shoulders associated with being stubborn? Is that? It's about, it's about carrying weight, shoulder and carrying weight. Mm -hmm. And so for me, because the relationship just wasn't the right fit, I felt like I had I had this 180 pound man sitting on me. I had the house sitting on me. I had the kids sitting on me. I had this work sitting on me and this, my own career, which I created I had my own business. And so it was so heavy. It literally broke a shoulder. I mean, I literally had to have shoulder surgery to fix some of the things that were broken inside. And so had I, had I known back then what I knew now that, Sucking, sucking down Prozac is probably a good sign that you're on the right track. <laughs> They're um, not back then, that, was the, that was the drug of choice back then. Now it's moved on to other things. I don't, Selects, I don't really I know. think. Yeah, <laughs> whatever the new one is. But um, I, I stopped cold turkey after I saw her because I would rather feel – I wanted to at that point, I said, look, I'd rather feel bad than mask feeling mm-hmm. and feel nothing because right. when you take those drugs, you feel nothing, absolutely nothing. And so – I went cold turkey. I'm like, I don't, I'd rather cry, feel like I'm going to cry all day and not be able to feel like I can't get out of bed and that, you know, that dark gloomy cloud. I'd rather have that than be on meds. And then I knew that I had to pursue passion. So for me, I had to get on track completely. So I went and um, I, I started auditioning. (laughs) She told me to be an actor. So I'm like, okay, fine. Uh, So I um, suited my, my, suited my body up, covered up my roles. (laughs) my belly I put like literally a corset on and put on these like this really 
puffy skirt and boots and went to audition. And I went to the, it was a, my, it was, it took me about a year. I'll be honest. It took me like a year to kind of get myself ready to go. But, um, I showed up on my birthday the following year to my first audition for Oliver. <laughs> totally unprepared. Didn't know what I was doing. And I had, <laughs> I figured, well, she told me I was going to be an actor, so let's give it a shot. And I showed up in front of these people and they're called auditors, you know, I sit at that table and they just basically say, sing me a song. And I was like, are you kidding? I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I had not sung. I really didn't know what I was doing. I sang the only song that I knew, which was Wouldn't It Be Loverly? And I was so terrified. I was shaking to the point where my hands would not, I couldn't make them stop moving. I mean, couldn't make them stop shaking. So I pinned them behind my back. I sang the song in the worst screechy, most <laughs> horrific voice, worse than anything you've ever even seen on American Idol, you know, where some of those people are like, ah, I can sing, and they can't sing at all. Yeah, yeah. And I just stared at these guys, and they're looking at me like, okay, you know, that don't give up your day job kind of look. And then, weirdly, the director said, thanks, uh, but will you read this part? We want you to read the part of Nancy. And I looked at her like, that's the lead. <laughs> I was like, Awesome. So I took the little script and I, I just kind of, I don't know, a little accent came over me and I got really kind of sassy in my pose and I just reading with her about Oliver and Bill and how horrible Bill is and Fagan is to Oliver. And I did this whole thing and uh, they kind of all got a little brighter and a little happier looking and they are like, oh, okay, great. So she stands up, she like walks me to the door and I'm thinking she's trying to kick me out of here. Um, but I left and I said, thank you. And we shook hands. And, um, and then I just did the biggest happy dance ever in the snow. Cause again, it was February. And, um, and I was like, you know, I showed up, mm -hmm. I had the guts to show up knowing I wasn't really prepared. I didn't really know what I was doing and I wasn't really suited. You know, actors are supposed to be all tiny and skinny and, and all these things, but I didn't let any of that stop me. So I showed up and then, um, waited you know, and waited and then waited and waited. And I thought, okay, Sonia said that I can do this. So I know I can do it. And I knew about the law of attraction at that point, And I knew about the law of intention and I knew about the law of action. And so I waited and waited and waited. And finally about a week, uh, a week later, I got the call and I was like, oh my God. And she, I picked it up and they're like, hello. And I'm like, yeah, hi. And she said, we'd like to offer you a part. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I was thinking, Nancy, 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 Nancy. And she goes, we want to offer you the part of townsperson one. Oh, right. That, I was like, yes. I was like the happiest person alive. I was thrilled beyond belief because I was an actor. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter that it was a community <laughs> theater and I couldn't sing a lick, uh, but I got to dance on stage and I got to kick in where like, do a can can and I had the big puffy skirts and the cute boots and I had so much fun. I lost 30 pounds. Wow. And I had the most amazing time with that. It takes like they, they, they rehearse forever. So it took three months of rehearsing and um, I showed up for my first play, took that bow and I knew this is it. And so one thing led to another and now I'm, I'm a SAG actor and I just did a movie with Paul Servino that is coming out. Um, in March, it's going to be in select theaters throughout the states Excellent. and called Precious Metal. And so it took a long time to get there. You know, it was 10 straight years of working this, uh, but I was able to lose the weight. Um, I became an actor. I, I overcame the fear of writing. I wrote the book, got that out, and now doing what she probably would have said was my path all along, which is more teaching, healing, and coaching. And so it's it's all about showing up, really not placating to your fears at all just understanding that the fears are really just <laughs> i just they're, they're just faulty messages mm -hmm. well and also it, i think it's um like that opportunity where we're growing and we're stretching and we're kind of stepping out past that like if we were to draw a little comfort circle around us it's like sticking our toe it's like yes this is you stepping out of this bubble <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And it's amazing how once you overcome the fear, and, and I am I am dedicated, I, I have to, this is the first time I'm stating this, but I am dedicated for the rest of my life to figure out the most effective tools and the most effective techniques that I can possibly find to help everybody eliminate 
our faulty programming because mm-hmm. every we're all working on the same fears. Isn't that funny? We all have the same basic fears, yeah. you know, that we're either not good enough, we're not lovable, that we're going to end up alone, that somehow the universe will not provide, and that there's scarcity, and that we're going to end up on, I always say, in a shelter. <laughs> with you know like this ratty ratty blanket and we won't be able to put food on the table and so we're all working on these various aspects of the same fears and um what's been really helpful is i'm finding i'm working on a couple techniques right now which will be in the second book but they're they're like a combination of a bunch of different techniques i found and they seem to be incredibly effective mm-hmm. and get rid of that original nugget that got stuck in your head that said you can't do something you're not good enough you're not beautiful you're not special, you're not lovable, whatever it might be, and to eliminate it. Mm-hmm. Because imagine if we were all walking around and, and didn't hold on to, didn't have this little faulty programming, you know, that little crack, that little crack in the asphalt that said, you can't have somebody who loves you. No one's going to love you. Or you're never going to perceive your, no one thinks you're beautiful, therefore you're not beautiful. Of course you're beautiful. Of course you're wonderful. Of course you deserve to have your heart filled. You deserve to sing and dance and do whatever you want to do. And so um, so I want to be able to help people long run with that and, and to actually eliminate it. So I've been having so much fun working on that because I, I, I'm able to, we all know it comes from childhood very often. Those patterns come from childhood. And, uh, you know, there was an experience where you had where you made a decision about yourself. And that decision was that you either were going to go in one direction or not go in a direction or that there was something very bad or wrong about you. Mm-hmm. None of those are real. That's right. all where we're, it's self-created. And so um, I, I hope that that's the one thing I can really offer from this day forward is many different tools and techniques so we can eliminate it. And, uh, you know, just a quick example, um, and this is just from my personal life, I'd always wanted to be on the water. And I've wanted a boat since I was probably like five years old. And um, we learned a lot about, you know, always being in scarcity and it's never enough, which is part of what the consumption is all about. Mm-hmm. Consumption is yeah. your phone isn't cool enough, your shoes aren't cool enough, your nail polish isn't cool enough. And so I'd always wanted this boat, but I had in my head this message, oh, you can't have a boat. You know, boat owners have to have $8 million and you have to have a yacht. You know, I mean, <laughs> they, have, they have a yacht with a crew. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So, so it was really funny. I, I finally overcame all that. And I said, you know what? I love it so much that let's go drive around. And so we went to Lake County, Illinois. And we were just driving around literally for fun, checking out, just checking out the area. And there's this little boat on the side of the road. And it was just a, I call it the vintage lady, which <laughs> they make fun of me because she's 80. She's like from 1980s. And this little boat we purchased for so little money. And it has given us such great joy. And we go out on the chain of lakes, and we put her on Lake Michigan. And the thing is just like, will not sink. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but I mean, it's been a perfect ride, the perfect little boat. It costs very little. And it's it's got the old engine like they have in the lo- old-time lawnmowers. That's how this boat is. <laughs> but it's so hardy that uh, the boat gives us such joy that, you know, when we say we have a boat, it's not like a yacht. <laughs> and it's right. got a couple paddles in there just in case, you know, just in case. But, you know, we, we, we go where we can feel safe and have just a, a glorious time all summer. And so the kids are on the boat. We're pulling people behind the boat. And the boat's created such great joy. I thought, wow, everybody should have what they want. You know, mm-hmm. why, can't, why can't we just do everything in, in a version that works for us? Yeah. Simple, uh, reasonable, but pure fun. Just mm-hmm. things that are pure fun. And it doesn't even matter what it is, you know. Whatever, whatever gets you, whatever turns your light on, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> whatever floats your boat. <laughs> Speaking of the vintage lady, like, oh, mom, don't call the boat that. That sounds terrible. I said, but I think she's like me, <laughs> the vintage lady. Oh, honey, you're not vintage. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're so sweet. Well, I've been around the block a few times, so you know, recrafting and recrafting at forty. You know, I'm recrafting at fifty, so. You know, it, it's just, it's all about just being really real and authentic and enjoying yourself as much as possible and turning that light on as much as possible wherever you are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So as we wrap up, what would be a tip for the listeners that want to, they're questioning maybe where they are and they're wanting to maybe t- do a little reboot. What, what, what would you recommend for them? Well, I'm, I'm going to have to say uh, I really recommend reading the book, The yes. Real Press Ring, Change Your Life, of course, now. <laughs> yep. There are 14 shortcuts for happy living in there. 
Uh, that is how I changed my life. Um, I've been able to help people all over the country in the workshops and the reboot workshops. And these 14 shortcuts boil down all the key things that you need to remember during the day so that you can have a much happier, much more fulfilling life. And one, for example, is just learning that it's what you think about, you bring about. I mean, it's mm-hmm. the fundamental rule of manifestation. Whatever you're paying attention to, focusing on, talking about, and especially writing down, you are bringing to yourself. So as much as you can manage that and recreate your thoughts so that they're exactly the way you want them to be, that helps change your day. And it, believe me, everything you're focusing on is coming your way. So it also helps craft your future because mm-hmm. you're bringing it right to you. Mm-hmm. If you can keep the thoughts positive and you can keep them about what you love and what you desire, that's exactly what's coming. So very simple shortcuts. But these shortcuts have uh, literally changed my life, and they're, I think they have been enormously helpful for others. So uh, one thing that I have, and I'm going to have, I have a whole new website coming up soon. Excellent. It's called, Di- it's going to be Diane.net. Oh, I love it. So, so simple and right, so pure. <laughs> I know. I was so happy to be able to get it. And um, I'm going to be able to give away the 14 shortcuts. Uh, the website should be up within the next couple weeks. And so if you, you can go to Diane.net right now, it's called Live Your Everything, but we're, we're rebooting again. We're recrafting mm-hmm. and, and going to have the four, the 14 shortcuts will be available in a PDF. Excellent. And if you sign up for our newsletter and, um, we're going to have all kinds of resources for health, wellness, hate to say it, anti-aging and for personal growth and development. And I'm going to try to put almost like a sanctuary for rebooting in this new website. Very exciting. Lots of really cool things coming up. But I know until then that you have um, a chapter of your book you're going to share. It's pretty much the first chapter of the book, and it sets up the <laughs> the story, the dramatic <laughs> tale. Yeah, uh, I know. You leave them at, like, hanging on the edge. <laughs> I, 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 it wasn't as if I intended, but I feel like it's the cliffhanger like we have at the end of the series. It's like, da, da, da. You know, like they, all the good, all the good TV yeah. series, they leave you where, oh, she got shot, you know, how to get away with murder, you know. And so, so it kind of sets up the story of the American dream and how the American dream, I feel like I was a complete, um, complete casualty of the American dream. And so it sets that up a little bit and leaves you sitting right there ready to move forward and see how the whole thing can get resolved. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, and it, you're certainly in for a wild ride when you read her book. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. This was such this was such a fun and joyful conversation. <laughs> thank you. This has been a delight. I really love talking to you. Well, I'm glad. I always try to have fun and, you know, really get to the, the juicy stuff in these uh, conversations. So, So thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Awesome. And now for you, my gorgeous goddess. Was there something Diane or I shared that resonated with you? If so, we'd love to hear about it. Head on over to today's show page at theawakengoddess.com and leave us a comment. Did you enjoy this episode? If so, subscribe to the show on iTunes and please share it with all of your friends. And if you want even more incredible resources, join the Awakened Goddess community to get Diane's gift and bonus content from the show. And until next time, goodbye, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Awakened Goddess Show. I hope you enjoyed today's guest and got something you can start using in your life right away. For more spiritual insights and to listen to more episodes, subscribe to The Awakened Goddess Show at theawakenedgoddess.com and discover wisdom that'll change your life.